All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome. I want to thank you uh, for attending this important hearing on threats uh, to media freedom worldwide. I want to thank Danielle Johnson and the staff of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission for organizing this hearing. I also want to thank our witnesses for testifying and uh, for everything, everything they do to support the right to free expression. I also want to acknowledge um, Isha Nassim, who, uh, who this is her last day with, uh, with the Commission. We want to thank her publicly for all of her uh, great work and dedication. Uh, media freedom is an invaluable component of an, in, of an empowered democratic society. Our definitions of media are rapidly expanding, especially with the rise of social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter. No matter what, no matter what kind of media they turn to, people are empowered when they have access to different sources of, of information and the ability to participate in a free exchange of ideas. People are also empowered when journalists and bloggers are allowed to expose injustices and abuses of power. Without these freedoms, people cannot hold their governments accountable and demand respect for their rights. Unfortunately, the media is under attack in many places. Authoritarian regimes in countries including China, Russia, and Iran are developing increasingly sophisticated tools to keep the media under their control and to punish journalists who refuse to toe the official line. Even in some established democracies like Chile, Hungary, and Turkey, ruling parties have been cracking down on unfavorable press coverage. Simply for trying to report the truth, journalists are too often the targets of legal restrictions, economic pressures, censorship, harassment, threats, unlawful detention, torture, and even murder. And too often these violations go unpunished. In this hearing, we will examine threats to media freedom from a global perspective, and we will look in depth at three countries where journalists face especially difficult, though varying, conditions, Honduras, Russia, and Turkey. I am deeply concerned about the escalating violence against journalists in Honduras. According to Freedom House, Honduras is the second most dangerous country in the world for journalists, with 19 journalists killed since the 2009 coup. Those who oppose the current government or offend powerful interest groups are consistently targeted with death threats and assassinations. A, per a, per a pervasive culture of impunity uh, facilitates this violence. In Russia, a lack of accountability for killings of investigative journalists is also a serious problem, as, state as, as is state control and censorship of most of the mainstream media. While the Internet is touted by the Russian government as a forum for free discussion, the Kremlin has repeatedly manipulated it uh, by censoring content, content, hacking accounts, and engaging in cyber attacks. Against this backdrop, I am very troubled by Russia's new law on regulating the Internet, which gives Russian authorities even greater leeway to repress online oppression. Uh, I'm sorry, to, to repress online opposition. Turkish journalists uh, do not uh, generally face the same deadly dangers as journalists in Honduras or Russia, but Turkey has one of the highest numbers of imprisoned journalists in the world. In April, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe reported that 95 Turkish journalists are in jail. The threat of detention for criticizing the government has created a climate of self-censorship among Turkish journalists, undermining freedom of expression in a democracy that is often held up as a model for countries in the Middle East. This hearing is an opportunity uh, to uh, examine the wide range of threats facing journalists and the media across the globe. Although journalists don't tend to think of themselves this way, they are among the world's most important human rights defenders, and the United States should strongly support their important but often dangerous work. Um, and at this time, I'd like to yield to uh, the gentleman from New Jersey who's been very active on these issues and, someone, and, a, and a number of other human rights issues, uh, Congressman uh, Chris Smith. <clears throat> thank you very much, Chairman McGovern, and thank you for convening this very important hearing, and I want to welcome um, Secretary Michael Posner, uh, back to the uh, to the Lantos Commission, and thank him for his work. Mr. Chairman, I'll be very brief, and I ask that my full statement be made part of the record. Freedom of the media is an essential foundation for democracy, the rule of law, and the protection of all other human rights. It is not surprising that journalists are so often become the first casualties in the fight to protect those rights. They are the ones who inform, ignite, and inspire other human rights defenders and democracy activists. Thus, they are at the gravest threat to any repressive government. One-way dictatorships protect their powers by controlling access uh, 
to their journalistic work, especially on the Internet. In December, uh, I introduced H.R. 3605, updating the Global Online Freedom Act, first introduced in 06. Their response to the growing global use of the Internet as a tool of censorship and surveillance. It is designed to help ensure that U.S. companies are not complicit in re the repression of human rights. We cannot allow the Internet to be turned into a weapon of mass surveillance. The new GOFO would keep the Internet open to journalists and everyone else through three key provisions. First, it requires the State Department to identify by name Internet restricting countries. Second, the Global Online Freedom Act requires Internet companies listed on the U.S. stock exchanges to disclose to the Securities and Exchange Commission how they carry out their human rights due diligence, including how they collect and share personally identifiable information with repressive countries. Finally, in response to the numerous reports of U.S. technology being used to track down or conduct surveillance of activists on the Internet or mobile devices, this bill would prohibit the export of hardware or software that could be used for surveillance, tracking, blocking, uh, and the like to the governments of Internet-restricting countries. I do hope that we get an opportunity to vote on it soon. I've already reported it out of my subcommittee, uh, the Global Human Rights Subcommittee. Another way dictatorships protect their power is by directly silencing journalists through imprisonment and violence. According to Reporters Without Borders, at least 38 citizen journalists and media workers have been killed in Syria alone by the Assad government since the, star since the start of the uprising there. Uh, finally, journalists investigating the government corruption are especially vulnerable. Uh, as we all know, Vla Vladimir Putin has stepped up his efforts to investigate a decade-long string of mysterious murders of journalists. I'm sorry to say there have been no meaningful progress on any of those cases. A climate of impunity, impunity uh, continues to prevail. Russia is by no means the only country in the OSCE region where journalists face serious threats. The situation in much of Central Asia remains grim as well. But Russia does stand out for the number of journalists who have died an apparent, uh, from apparent retribution uh, for their uh, incisive work. I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing and yield back. Well, and thank you very much for your statement. Um, I would now like to turn to our witnesses for this afternoon's hearing. Along with their oral testimony, I would like to submit uh, into the record any written testimony provided by our witnesses. Uh, I would like to welcome once uh, again to this committee our first witness, uh, Michael H. Posner, Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor at the State Department. Mr. Posner, you have been a strong defender of media freedom, and I am grateful to you and your colleagues at the State Department for your leadership on this issue. And um, we welcome your presence here and your statement. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and, and Congressman Smith. Thank you both for being here. Uh, and giving me the opportunity to discuss both traditional and emerging threats to fundamental freedoms, uh, both online and offline. Uh, I want to begin by broadening the way we talk about uh, the threats, uh, new threats to free expression, because the traditional terms, media freedom and censorship, no longer reflect the full spectrum of what is happening around the world. I want to also uh, step back and remind everyone that 200 years ago, James Madison, one of the uh, principal authors of the U.S. Constitution, wrote that a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or both. Um, the, m the more uh, globalized our world has become, the more critical is the free flow of information and news to our policies, our economies, and the ability of citizens in every country to make informed decisions about their own lives and to hold governments accountable. Recognizing the vital importance of information, the Obama administration has redoubled our efforts to track the broad range of threats to media freedom today and to respond to these new challenges. These threats include the use of criminal libel, defamation or incitement laws, misuse of terrorism laws to prosecute journalists, prosecutions designed to inflict crippling financial damage on news organizations, increase in government ownership of media outlets, shutdown of websites, social media sites, threats against physical attacks on assassinations of disappearances of journalists, particularly those reporting on criminal activity like drugs 
and corruption. Uh, and the inability or unwillingness of governments to protect journalists or prosecute those responsible for attacks. As Mr. Chair, you raised the cases in Honduras. We all remember the brutal murder of Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl 10 years ago now in Pakistan. In the last decade, the use of violence to intimidate journalists and news organizations has worsened. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, who I know you'll hear from in a few moments, 15 journalists have been murdered so far in 2012. That's in addition to 14 killed in the line of duty um, uh, this year. The number of journalists under duress keeps growing, and so must our work to protect them. At a moment when a number of important countries are in transition, both toward and away from democracy, we need to focus on threats to the free flow of information because these are threats to democracy itself. Uh, this spring, we launched a Free the Press campaign in the run-up to World Press Freedom Day. Under Secretary of State Tara Sonnenshine observed that media freedom is the moral equivalent of oxygen. It's, it's how society breathes. When freedom of expression is cut off, economies stagnate, societies suffer, individuals grasp for breath. A global information infrastructure that supports free markets and prosperous societies cannot be built atop a foundation of censorship, repression, or intimidation. And so we're deeply concerned, as you both are, about the worsening climate for media freedom, for example, in Russia. Earlier this month, the Duma passed laws enabling internet censorship and recriminalizing defamation. The Duma also discussed labeling news outlets that are funded internationally as foreign agents, a stigmatizing term that now applies to NGOs, and we can talk also about a new NGO law that's just passed. We're also concerned when Bloomberg News website is blocked in China after reporting on the business interests of some members of the Chinese leadership. While each country has its political sensitivities in our financially uh, interdependent world, the ability to have diverse and independent reporting of business news is critical to the proper functioning of markets, companies, and international monetary institutions. But it's not just governments that are threatening freedom of the press. It's also criminal gangs, terrorists, sometimes political factions. We see a rising threat to media freedom in an established democracy like Mexico, where eight journalists have been killed so far this year. Last month, unknown assailants sprayed bullets through grenades into the offices of El Norte and La, Man La Manana newspapers. La Manana announced it would no longer report on drug violence joining other media which have quietly adopted similar self-censorship policies. The government of Mexico is working to improve protection it provides to journalists and rights defenders, and we will continue to work with that government as it addresses such violence. While the U.S. is eager to cooperate with other countries in combating terrorism, we will voice our concerns when governments abuse anti-terrorism laws to suppress free speech. We've made it clear in our human rights dialogues with a number of governments that media freedom is a fundamental element of a democratic society. At the same time, rapid technological changes require us to adopt a broader conceptual framework for defending freedom in this dig digital age. I want to highlight three broad trends we see emerging. The first trend is the changing nature of censorship itself. A decade ago, media censorship was based primarily on a system of prior restraints. Most governments that censored had a stable and predictable relationship with newspapers, magazines, TV stations, etc. Government red lines were known, so were the likely punishments for failure to practice self-censorship. Today, it's a different story. Every individual with access to social media can be a publisher or broadcaster. Ordinary citizens with no journalistic training can send multimedia reports around the world at a production cost of next to nothing. When everybody is a news gatherer, a publisher, a broadcaster, prior restraint is far less feasible. Very few countries can delete every Facebook post that criticizes the government or every tweet calling for protesters to assemble. What they can do is punish expression after the fact. So the tr second trend we're seeing is social media repression. 
<clears throat> governments prosecuting or persecuting internet and social media users for what they blog, post, tweet, or text. We've reported on more than 60 individuals in 17 countries who've been ex uh, arrested for their online expression in the last 20 months. They range from journalists and webmasters to political activists to an ordinary Saudi woman sentenced to 50 lashes, allegedly for using a swear word in a text message. These individuals have been prosecuted under a dizzying array of existing laws being repurposed for use against digital expression, including libel, distortion, disrupting social order, incitement of protest, or of ethnic hatred, blasphemy, subversion, terrorism, defamation, inciting others to action under the pretext of freedom of expression. Social media can be an invaluable tool for governments that want to understand the needs, views, and problems of their people and respond quickly, including cases of natural disaster. It must not become a new frontier for micro-targeting repression. Because much of the public debate now takes place online, the pro uh, persecution of people for what they post online amounts to criminalizing conversation. The advent of the Internet uh, thought police trolling social media for criminal forms of expression is a violation of human rights and a serious step backwards for freedom. Third and finally is the continuing threat to internet freedom in individual countries and to global system of internet governance. I've testified about this before, but I want to note that in most of the wire, wired world, any threat to internet freedom is by ne definition a threat to media freedom everywhere. And Congressman Smith, I very much appreciate your ongoing efforts in this regard. On the positive side, I'm I'm very proud of the fact that 17 countries, including the United States, have now joined a coalition for freedom online to help defend Internet freedom. We've played a key role in that. We're also working collectively to keep advanced communications technologies from being deployed in by the worst human rights offenders against their own citizens. This spring, as you know, President Obama signed an executive order restricting the export of technologies that have been that can be used for internet surveillance in both Iran and Syria. This was an important step, but we must, and we will, continue to be vigilant about evolving threats to freedom that are so vital to prosperity and democratic progress around the world. Thank you very much. I'm glad to answer thank your you, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Posner, the, the U.S. government has allocated about $300 million to foreign aid and exchange programs that support a free press and internet freedom since 2009. Uh, what impact have you seen from these programs designed to support media freedom? What kinds of programs uh, do the most uh, to advance the cause of media freedom, and how can the United States best marshal its resources in support of media freedom globally? <clears throat> Again, I'm, um, I'm very uh, proud of the efforts uh, we've made uh, in the last three and a half years to address uh, internet freedom in particular. So let me take that as one example of where the money's been spent. We've spent uh, now over $70 million uh, through an effort out of our office and others at State and, and AID, uh, both to um, work with online activists to protect them as in their use of these new social media. Uh, we've trained more than 5,000 activists, uh, trainers who are now training people in their own societies in countries all over the world, giving them a better sense of both how to use uh, uh, the Internet, cell phone technology, um, but to use it in a way that provides them the kinds of protections that they often don't know exist. Um, we've also funded a range of uh, entrepreneurs, uh, social entrepreneurs, who are helping devise new technologies um, to help protect these individuals. And we continue to be involved in various efforts um, to uh, increase the capacity to circumvent the various um, uh, firewalls and restrictions that governments like Iran and China uh, put in place. I think the, the second piece that I'm very proud of is the fact that we are holding the line on the notion that the Internet and, and uh, the Internet is really the town square of the 21st century. And for us, these are human rights issues. The Internet is the 
uh, place where free speech, free assembly, free association is playing itself out in 2012. And in a variety of ways, I mentioned a couple in my testimony, mm. we are spending time and energy and diplomatic resources to fight off various efforts by governments like Russia and China and others who want to place burdensome controls or global restrictions uh, on the Internet. The Internet is working fine, and our view is that the open space that's been created needs to be maintained, and I think we're taking a lead in that effort. Thank you. Uh, President Obama issued an executive order this year restricting uh, the export to Iran and Syria of technologies that could be used for online spying. Uh, are you aware of any instances in which the technical means used by autocratic governments to repress freedom of expression are provided by U.S. companies? Uh, what is the administration doing to restrict such technology transfers, not only to Iran and Syria, but also to other author authoritarian governments? And how can we best ensure that technological advances enable independent media rather than serving as a tool uh, of authoritarian state control? Well, I think uh, this is also an important part of our what we're calling 21st century statecraft. Uh, we are um, uh, among the many things that uh, American diplomats are now uh, needing to do is to understand the nature of these new social media and how they're being used and misused. I was in Libya about six weeks ago, and in Libya we discovered after the fall of Gaddafi uh, the uh, many ways in which he was uh, using technology manufactured in the West, not necessarily in the United States, but in other countries, uh, to spy on his own people, to repress his own people. Uh, it's now part of our diplomatic uh, portfolio that we need to be very mindful in repressive countries of what governments are doing, both by laws and by the use of these new technologies in a negative way, uh, to both restrict access uh, to make it more difficult for people, citizens, to communicate among themselves and with the rest of the world, um, but also the new technologies they're using and importing from countries uh, that, are, that have uh, advanced technology as tools to basically uh, enhance their repressive techniques. Oh, 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 you know, I know uh, and you may not know the answer to this off, right off the top of your head, but I'm just trying to figure out whether there are any U.S. companies that are providing technical assistance to countries that are basically repressing the freedom of the media. Uh, and, um, and you know, again, obviously we had an executive order on Iran and Syria because we know that these technologies can be misused. I'm just wondering whether there are other countries that uh, U.S. companies may be uh, as assisting that, uh, that are using the technical means to, uh, you know, to basically restrict uh, the freedom of the press. You know, I'm not uh, on a day-to-day -day basis monitoring uh, the technology and where it's going and where we're, we certainly have, let me, let me put it this way, the <coughs> concerns that we've identified and acted on with respect to Syria and Iran, those are not the only two repressive governments in the world. And so we are constantly monitoring and mindful of both what U.S. and other uh, companies are doing in other places where we know governments are okay. uh, violating human rights. I'd be glad to go back no. and look in I, yeah, and see if we have, the, have other examples, but I don't have that. them at the tip of my fingers. Because obviously, you know, it, you know one of the ways to, that, that we could be helpful here is to try to encourage U.S. companies not to provide that kind of technical assistance. Uh, just one, one <coughs> final question for me, and, that, and that's on the issue of Honduras. Um, I'm worried that the, that the human rights situation in Honduras in general um, is deteriorating. I had a meeting with a, a, a de de delegation from Massachusetts in my office in Massachusetts um, at the beginning of this week. They just returned from Honduras and were very, very concerned about the human rights situation and the issue of, of uh, the freedom of the press. And I'm just curious, what types of assistance are, does the United States provide Honduras to help uh, protect freedom of, of the press? And in your opinion, are Honduran authority, authorities currently meeting the human rights conditions set out in the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2012? Well, let me say, first of all, that uh, echoing your concern, uh, we see a climate of violence and widespread impunity <coughs> in Honduras, uh, which makes it uh, one of the most 
uh, dangerous places in the region. And as you say, uh, NGOs are saying that along with Mexico, uh, Honduras has become one of the most dangerous countries for media in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, seven journalists uh, killed in the first three months. So the problem is very real. Um, we are very focused on the impunity, the lack of accountability for these and other crimes. Um, we're very concerned about the need for greater discipline uh, among the Honduran security forces, the police in particular. Uh, and we're very concerned uh, that there be uh, international attention as well as domestic attention to these attacks on uh, Honduran journalists, um, including a, a radio host who was killed uh, in the country's uh, northern coast. We very much are pressing this as a diplomatic matter, but we're also trying to do uh, some work with the government to improve their performance. We have, as you know, uh, created through the Central American Regional Security Initiative <clears throat> a special victims task force, uh, and our embassy in Tegucigalpa in January of 2011 uh, began working with the national police and the prosecutors from the public ministry. U.S. advisors are working on a regular basis uh, to uh, investigate uh, persecution of journalists as well as members of the LGBT community. Thus far, the task force's um, uh, work has led to six arrests, but there's much more that needs to be done. So we are taking steps. We're very mindful of the enormity of the problem, and we're very concerned both about the impunity but also about self-censorship. One, one thing that happens in a place where you've got this kind of violence is that journalists and others begin to say, I better not write that article, I better not include right. that paragraph because I could be next. And so we're very mindful both of the need for accountability, the need to create a climate where journalists can speak and write freely, and a need uh, also to work with the government to strengthen their institutions. Thank you. Mr. Smith? <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your testimony and for your leadership. Let me ask you a couple of questions, uh, first beginning with Russia. Uh, obviously, for years, as, as one of the members of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, we've raised the issue of Anna Pavlovskaya. Uh, and I know there's some people who have been indicted, but certainly nothing has happened in terms of uh, convictions yet. Uh, if you might want to speak to that issue in particular, some of the high-profile cases. I would just note parenthetically, I'll never forget on a trip to Moscow back in the 1980s. Uh, we met with members of the Duma before the first free and fair elections occurred, at least um, uh, democratic elections. And we met with members of the Duma and we had a roundtable discussion about press freedom. And Mickey Edwards, who was a publisher at the time of a newspaper, a uh, former member of Congress, we were part of a panel. And our, our friends on the, uh, from the Duma asked us how we handle criticism. And all of us wa talked about writing op-eds, trying to do a letter to the editor, get the, get the reporter and or editor to uh, understand that the, they got it wrong. And uh, they broke out laughing. <laughs> and one of them said, Duma, I mean, uh, Gulag. <laughs> and just said, that's how we handle it. We'll send them to the Gulag. And all of us you know, had a, a bit of a laugh, but it was, uh, you know, it, was a, it was a very heartbreaking moment in a way because so many people then were in the Gulag. My question is, um, you know, do you see the trend line at all improving in Russia? Uh, you know, the, the, uh, they're ranked, according to Freedom House, 172nd out of 197 worldwide in terms of media environment. Uh, Russia is even worse at 187th out of 197. Uh, I should say China is. And my, so, so the trend line in, in, in Russia and some of these high-profile cases. Um, I appreciate your raising that issue and your continued concern. Uh, we share the concern. Since the year 2000, at least 16 journalists have been killed in Russia. Um, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, these are journalists who are critical of the government or law enforcement agencies. <clears throat> you mentioned the case of uh, uh, Politovskaya, a case we followed closely. Right. Uh, we recently also publicly commented uh, on the uh, continued need for uh, justice and accountability in two other cases, uh, the uh, Natalia Estimarova case, a courageous journalist who reported from Chechnya, uh, and Paul Klebnikov, who was also a U.S. citizen. 
Uh, these are cases we continue to follow very closely. We continue to raise them with Russian officials. I did so last fall. I also mentioned in my testimony, and we're very concerned about uh, the recent uh, changes uh, in laws in, uh, that the Duma has passed uh, uh, under President uh, Putin, uh, one uh, enabling internet censorship, another decriminalizing or recriminalizing defamation. Uh, there's new uh, discussion now of laws labeling news outlets as foreign agents, uh, which is of great concern. And over the weekend, uh, the President Putin signed a law uh, on civil society, um, which we have been also extremely concerned about and which we've commented on. Uh, that law uh, applies burdensome requirements on human rights advocates and democracy groups and misrepresents them as foreign agents uh, when taking foreign funds. This is also going to have an effect on the media. And so this is a very tough climate for not only the media but civil society more broadly. And we will continue to raise our concerns um, as, uh, and, and very closely monitor what's, what's happening and how these laws are applied. Thank you. Robert Mahoney will testify uh, later from Committee to Protect Journalists that it's a dangerous time to be a journalist. That's a, a very obvious and a very profound statement. He noted the killings, the imprisonment, 15-year peak in 2011. But he also talked about the exiled numbers and some 450 over five years who have fled. I'm wondering how many of those have come to the United States, sought, and got asylum. Well, I don't know that number, but it's uh, judging from the number of uh, journalists, uh, exiled journalists that come to see me, the number's high. Okay. And, you know, I think this is a reflection. The world is changing in so many ways, but it is a reflection of the fact that as we have a more open space for not only traditional newspapers and news outlets, but we have the social media, um, governments that have something to hide um, are now finding it extremely threatening and difficult for them to uh, leave these things within their borders or hide them from their own people. Journalists are on the front lines along with human rights advocates and others in raising concerns about very legitimate grievances. And as they do that more frequently and with more um, uh, with, with greater access to a broader audience, I think we're going to see this as a very troubling trend uh, in the years ahead, and we've got to be sure. responsive. If you could, for the record, maybe get back to us if that is quantifiable, I how many? We'll try. We'll be talk to uh, DHS and okay. others and see if we can come up with some I appreciate numbers. that. It may not Just be a easy. few final questions if we do have a vote. Um, I know the U.S.-China dialogue, human rights dialogue, uh, you know, has happened, and maybe you might want to speak to the issue of... Uh, of the disappeared uh, who happened to be journalists. You know, did they have any response uh, to that? You know, uh, Freedom House points out that China is the world's largest poor perform performer. Uh, we all know that. They have cracked down. They have sold and, and shared their, their Internet uh, capabilities, which are huge in terms of uh, finding people and then ultimately incarcerating them or harassing them. Secondly, if you could real quick on, on Africa, where are the worst spots there. We know Somalia uh, and some of the other countries, if you could just speak to that very quickly. Um, and um, Turkey, there seems to be significant uh, regression there, but is that the case or not? Uh, you know, as, as is pointed out in um, uh, Freedom House's testimony, I believe, that, no, this would be a committee to protect journalists. Uh, they estimate that there are up to 5,000 criminal cases uh, open against reporters at the end of 2011, and certainly that has a chilly effect. Obviously, those who face that kind of action, it's awful, but everyone else takes their cue from that. What's happening in Turkey? Um, first of all, on China, we did uh, complete the uh, two-day human rights dialogue yesterday. I briefed the press this morning. Um, we had a uh, very um, uh, uh, direct conversation on media freedom and internet freedom, freedom of expression broadly. Uh, we raised a number of very specific uh, cases, including uh, Leo Jabot, uh, the internet uh, activist, human rights activist, who was the author of the Charter of the um, Charter 08 uh, Human Rights Manifesto, who is now uh, serving an 11-year term. 
Uh, he's been in jail for 1,325 days for, act- for writing a statement that says human rights and democracy ought to be respected. We've called repeatedly for his release. Uh, his wife, uh, Liao uh, Xia, is also under uh, house, basically under house arrest. We raised a number of other cases, which I'm glad to share with you, but also what great concern. What did they concern- say on Liao Xiaobo's case? Uh, we, ra- we raised the no, case. No, what did they say? I, thank you for raising uh, it. We have, uh, you know, in, in general, uh, a back and forth. I'm not going to get into every detail, but we will continue to press the case. Uh, I think it's fair to say I'm not satisfied with the response on that. Uh, we have, but we get into it in quite a bit of detail. We also raised the case of journalists that are, uh, including Melissa Chan from Al Jazeera, who was a uh, uh, f- uh, forced to leave China and the English language service of Al Jazeera shut down. A number of foreign journalists are being um, are having very difficult time now, as well as Chinese journalists and bloggers. And so we will continue to to press those cases uh, as we have in the past. I, I would say on the in the case of Africa that we could go through lots of countries, but one in particular that I would say we are having a very difficult time with is uh, Ethiopia. Uh, I was going to say something about it in my testimony, but we're deeply uh, concerned about the trial, uh, conviction, and sentencing of an Ethiopian journalist named Eskender Nega. Um, And uh, there are a number of other cases where the governments used anti-terrorism laws to jail journalists and opposition parties. We've got a range of problems in Eritrea in the DRC, and a range of other places. Uh, the list is too long, and you've got to vote. But I would say that we're, again, trying to do everything we can to raise these issues. Um, and I don't raise them alone. Uh, Secretary Clinton is terrific. In every meeting I'm with her, uh, the human rights issues are raised prominently, and she pays a great deal of attention to freedom of expression and Internet freedom. On Turkey, again, we share your concerns, again, both about the ex- overly broad definition of terrorism, the overly broad application of or the disproportionate use of terrorism laws um, against journalists and writers. Um, we're concerned about the extent to which uh, journalists are under attack. Rob Mahoney, who's about to testify, was just there and can d- give you chapter and verse, but CPJ and others report many, many cases of harassment, violence, and imprisonment. Those are things we are very concerned about. And the third thing I would say is there is a growing trend in Turkey of uh, the government blocking uh, uh, sites. Uh, We have a statistic here as of December uh, 31st. uh, They'd blocked 15,000 websites uh, over the last several years. So we're talking about uh, both direct attacks against journalists, against self-censorship as a result, but also a real effort to curtail freedom on the Internet. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your testimony. And I, um, there are some things we have control over and some things we don't, and, and votes we don't. So the bad news is we have 10 votes. Um, so uh, this may mean probably about an hour or even maybe more of a delay. Uh, I hope everybody can stay with us, go have lunch, um, and, uh, and, then, and then come back. If you can't, um, let, the, let the staff know, but uh, this is something we, just, we, we have no control over. <laughs> so I apologize, but we will reconvene this after the last vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Posner.